and I'm going to introduce Anna Craft, Coordinator of Metadata Services, and Tiffany Henry, Discovery Cataloger. Um, I'm very excited about their session today, Advanced Search, the catalog can do that, and I think we are all in for a treat. So I will turn it over to Anna and Tiffany. Thank y'all. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks for uh, hosting our session today. And thanks for having the ULVLC sessions to begin with so that we can all learn from each other. We are very pleased to be doing this session today. And I want to start off with a question. Who recognizes this? This is kind of rhetorical. I hope you all recognize this. Great. People recognize it. What about this one? Who has seen this one before? Oh yeah, okay, good. Everyone's seen these. These are very familiar. So which one of these do you consider to be more advanced? I don't know. Any thoughts? The ugly one. <laughs> um, the one with the operators, red box with labels. Um, yeah, so we've got, we've got some different feelings about which one is more advanced. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today, or what we're both going to be talking about, is ways that you can actually use the red box to do extremely advanced searches. So here's what we're going to look at. Boolean searching search indexes in WorldCat, and I'll explain what that means. We'll talk about subject searching and Library of Congress subject headings. We won't, probably won't spend too much time on search activities, but there are some activities that y'all can do. Um, when we have initially developed this session, it was for reference interns, and we did a lot more hands-on stuff. Um, so there are some activities that you can do if you want, and then we'll share some resources as well. So, Tiffany is going to start us off with talking about Boolean searching. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm going to quickly go over some Boolean searching basics. Uh, next slide, please. Oops, sorry. Here we go. So as a quick overview, Boolean searching is derived from Boolean algebra, which was created in the 19th century by English mathematician George Boole. So Boolean searching uses logical operators and search systems like our, catalog, like our library catalog to help structure queries. WorldCat supports the Boolean operators and, or, and not. And for these words to function as operators in the catalog, they must be in all caps when searching. Next slide, please. So the first operator and returns items containing all the terms in the query. So for example, searching for feminism and pop culture will bring back items pertaining to both topics. The plus sign symbol can also serve as an optional character that can be used in place of and. Next slide, please. The next operator or returns items that contain any single term in the query or all of them. For example, when searching the subject heading, headings, visual literacy or information literacy, this will yield results containing items that have either subject assigned or both. Uh, next slide, please. The third operator not will exclude any items, any search terms after it. So for example, searching for vegetarian cooking, not vegan cooking, will retrieve results pertaining only to vegetarian cooking and leave out anything that may contain overlap between the two topics. Like and, the minus sign is an optional character that can be used in place of not. Next slide, please. So in addition to the operators, there are some other key characters and functions that are helpful to know. I'll quickly cover the use of parentheses, quotation marks, truncation, and wildcards. And before proceeding, I want to mention that different search systems will use different characters for these functions, namely the truncation and wildcards. So I will go over the ones that WorldCat uses, but if you're searching in a different system or database, take a moment to see what symbols it uses. Next slide, please. So parentheses are used to nest search terms within the same query. With nesting terms, you can easily mix three Boolean operators while telling the system what order you would prefer the search to run. So use parentheses and nest terms when using more than one operator and three or more search terms. For example, if you search for vegan and nutrition or cooking with parentheses around the last two search terms, next slide please. 
This means that the catalog will search and return items about vegan nutrition, vegan cooking, and any resources about all three topics. If we remove the parentheses around the terms nutrition and cooking, the catalog will process the operators in direct order with and first and or second, meaning that the search will yield resources about vegan nutrition and then any resource about cooking in general. Next slide, please. So quotation marks are used to enclose a word that you don't want the system to think is a Boolean operator. Adding quotation marks is intended to provide more precision in the search results. So this is useful if you're searching for terms that contain the words and or are not within them. But what I've observed when searching in WorldCat is that the use of quotation marks around words that are also operators and around the entire query reduces the amount of search results returned. Presumably this will improve precision, but the most relevant results in the examples that I tested tend to appear first regardless of the use of quotation marks. So the two phrases that I tested are stop and frisk and fight or flight. Next slide, please. So here's some snapshots from WorldCat showing the number of results after each query. As seen here, the use of quotation marks narrows down the number of return results. So if you were to do these queries on your own, you would notice the same resources would appear on the top or at least the very first page of the search results page. So for stop and frisk, that would include resources about policing and criminal justice. For fight or flight, this would be a combination of resources where either those words appear in the title of the work or are topically relevant. Uh, next slide, please. The character used for truncation is an asterisk. When searching in the catalog, add it to the end of the term to get all the possible variant endings. And in order to utilize truncation in the search term, you need a minimum of three characters followed by the asterisk. So as an example, using the truncation symbol with the search term connect will retrieve connect, connection, connectivity, and any other variants. Next slide, please. So there are two symbols used as wildcard operators, the hash or pound sign symbol and the question mark. The hash replaces one character in a search string. For example, the search term with the hash over the second vowel will retrieve both women and women in the catalog. I'm unsure if it retrieves other variants like women with the X or a Y. Next slide, please. The second wildcard symbol, the question mark, replaces between zero and nine characters in the search term. In the first example here, the search term with the question mark retrieves two common spellings for the term encyclopedia. Using the question mark means that the system can exceed the one character limitation imposed by using the hash wildcard symbol. And in the second example here, the search term with the question mark and a four will retrieve terms like respiration, restoration, reservation, and any other vari variants that meet the requirement. The number four next to the question mark indicates how many variable characters in the string the system can retrieve. And now I will turn it back over to Anna. Thank you, Tiffany. So now we're gonna look at some search indexes in WorldCat. And as we move forward, we're gonna bring in some of these um, operators that Tiffany has talked about as well. So we're all familiar with the advanced search screen that's used for the main catalog. Um, and when you drop down from those boxes, you are able to search for search through specific indexes. So those indexes are searching specific fields within MARC records that are in WorldCat. So catalogers, when they're working on MARC records, are entering data, metadata in fields that correspond uh, through MARC fields to these different indexes. And you can pick from a whole list of things, author, ISBN, keyword, lots and lots of things to choose from. These are the advanced search indexes that are allowed from the advanced search box. So there are a lot of things that you can choose from. But we can actually do better. So there are even more searchable indexes in WorldCat and you can search them from the red box. There are actually too many options to list on this slide, but a few examples, access method, call number, genre form of the item, lots and lots of different things. And there's a go link at the bottom of the screen that takes you to a, um, a list, a very extensive list. You have to drop down um, and search through different alphabetical uh, sections of the various indexes that are available in WorldCat. So there are a whole lot that are available. And we search these indexes using what's called index labels. And these are alphanumeric. Most of them are letters. A couple of them include numbers. And they 
So it's usually two letters or numbers followed by either a colon if you're searching for a word or equal sign if you're searching for a phrase. And I would like to be able to say that all of this is an exact science, but I have actually not found that to be true in terms of some of these word phrase searches that we will see. Um, but these are some of the ones, some of the index labels that you can search. Call number is NU colon. I use that a lot when cataloging. The most common one I use though is TI from the red search box. Um, TI colon or TI phrase for searching for a known title in the catalog from the red box. So what does all of this mean? Here we're looking at the subject, the index uh, for subject and uh, the information from WorldCat. So we see a couple of different ways or places that we can search for this. We're ignoring connection, which is mostly used behind the scenes by catalogers. Um, we're ignoring first search as well. We're concentrating on WorldShare and WorldCat discovery. So we're looking at, we're focusing on subject and we can search either word, phrase or whole phrase, but we're gonna talk mostly about word and phrase. Our label that we see on the right is SU colon, and our label for phrase is SU equals. And this is the kind of information that you find for the various indexes throughout, um, that are uh, shared through WorldCat. So you can search by, or you can look up uh, what, what's shared about title or language or many of the other indexes. This is just an example. And a little bit more information when we're trying to learn about how we can search the subject indexes. So this tells us we can search um, by topic, people and organizations, and we see some examples at the very bottom. So they're actually combining a couple of different index searches, SU colon horror. And so we're throwing some Boolean in there, YR, which is year 1990, and MT, which is material type, and REC is I believe for recording. So we can combine a lot of different indexes into one search. So let's do a basic search. So uh, here I'm searching for subject memes in the catalog through using the red box. And the first result that I got is a book called Memes in Digital Culture. And if I look down in the record, if I click through and open the record for memes in digital culture and I scroll down, I can find memes listed near the top of the subjects that are attached to this book. So that's good because I was searching the subject index, so that word should definitely be in there. So things seem to be working as they should be. Um, so here's one that's a little bit more complicated. So this is a, a phrase search, SU equals dance and conflict management. So this is an actual subject heading and here is a book that came back as the first result, The Choreography of Resolution. Um, and if we click through into that record, we see the subject at the very top, Dance and Conflict Management. So again, we're finding what we hoped and expected. We know that this is the subject we want, and we're finding books that are about that. So that's great, but what if you don't know the official Library of Congress subject terms for your search? Is this really useful? So there are a couple of ways that you can find them if you want to do an official LCSH subject search. One way that you can do this is to work sort of backwards by finding a resource that you're interested in in the catalog and then looking at what subject headings are assigned to it and finding other books or other resources that way. You can also search directly for subject headings of interest online using the Library of Congress linked data service. And if the library was open and we had access to the materials that were there, we would be able to use the scary red books. But that's at the very bottom of the list because it's generally not the first choice for most searchers. I do wanna say that Library of Congress subject terms can be problematic. Um, this is a, a very 
old controlled vocabulary, it does get updated, but it doesn't get updated quickly. So terms do not always reflect the most current respectful terminology. Um, and this can be at times frustrating and potentially upsetting for patrons. Um, the terms also don't always reflect how novice users would search. So you may be encountering words that would be sort of at a higher level, more scientific, or not really things that a basic new searcher would know about a topic. And also it's a, just a very big, complicated controlled vocabulary, but it does not include terms for everything. So they've got a lot of information in Library of Congress subject headings, but they're still, for not every necessarily niche subject that you would be looking for, and especially if it's something that's new, it may not have gotten added yet. So let's quickly see about finding some subject headings in the catalog. Here I'm searching just a keyword search for library anxiety. I want to see if there's a corresponding subject heading or something like this. So I got a book, uh, Library Anxiety, Theory, Research, and Applications, and I'm going to click through to that record. And I'm going to go to View Description and drop that down. And then I've got a lot of subjects. And right at the top is Library Anxiety. And you see some of these are in English, some of these are in other languages. The Library of Congress official subject headings will be at the top of the list. So if it's at the top of the list, you are most likely good to go in terms of it being an actual Library of Congress subject heading. There are other subject vocabularies that are included here. Um, so tend to prefer, if you're working in Library of Congress, the ones that are at the top. But we can also search for the Library of Congress subject headings completely free online using the Library of Congress linked data service. And you can access this at go.uncg.edu slash LCSH. And here I'm about to do a search for a topic, astrology and pets. And I'm using LC subject headings, LCSH. And let's see what I get. So my search was for astrology and pets, and I actually got a result, astrology and pets, in the vocabulary Library of Congress subject headings. Let's click through to that record. So there's a lot of information here that may not be of interest or may be confusing to non-catalogers. Um, we do see that it has a universal resource identifier, a URI, that identifies this topic, this subject, and we see that it's part of Library of Congress subject headings. But if we go down further, we can see that a variant of this might be pets and astrology. So putting these things in the opposite order. The official term is astrology and pets, so that's what we want to use. There's also a broader term provided, and that's pets. So if we want to look at something more broad than astrology and pets, we can look at just pets. On the right, we see actual resources that have this subject heading attached to them. So if we were in the actual um, search system, we would be able to click through and look at MARC records for these resources. So this can be a way to find topics of interest um, based on their subject. So if y'all want to do a little searching really quickly, or if you want to ask any questions about subject searching or about searching the linked data um, service from the Library of Congress, this is a great time for that. Um, have, Jenny, have any questions come in so far that we can address right now? Sure. So Mark had asked earlier if phrases needed quotes, but I think that y'all covered that. Um, we had a little bit of conversation um, about the uh, astrology and pets, obviously. I mean, there's just so much there. Um, and uh, in response to uh, your discussion about LCSH not necessarily being very representative of like modern terminology or how we would usually mention things, I said it can be embarrassing. And uh, Mark yeah. said mainstreaming was long getting into LCSH. 
Yeah, yeah. It, I, I mean, as a cataloger, subject headings can be extremely useful, but you kind of have to know what you're dealing with and be prepared for the limitations that this vocabulary um, has. And they are definitely major limitations. Um, Paul just asked a question. Does subject phrase go across subfields? For instance, library users, dollar sign X psychology. I don't, I, you may have to actually look at this chat. So I'm looking at the, I, yeah, okay. I've got, that's why I have my iPad up so I can see this. So that's library users, subfield psychology. Hmm. Paul, this is a good question and we might actually have to, um, whoops, let's see. Well, we may come back to this at the end. I, so I would like to be able to say that I know everything about how this works, but I definitely do not. Um, so there are many intricacies to searching the catalog that are uh, yet to be explored. <laughs> Paul says, I wish I was also a good source of answers. Well, you are a very good source of answers. Um, but as we know, as catalogers, there are as many and more questions as there are answers. Um, so let's move forward here. And we may actually have time to come back to that at the end. Um, oh, here are the red books. If you're not familiar with the scary red books, this is what they look like. Um, and these are updated much less frequently than the online linked data service. So if you want something that is the most current in this outdated vocabulary, definitely go online. Um, if you really want to look at a print resource, this is something that you or a patron who prefers print can use. I believe there is a set of these in the reference area in the library. And I believe there's a set in tech services as well. So if the building was open, these are these would be available for people. Um, what do what does this look like if you actually open these books up? So this is a, a picture of some of the of a page from that. And we're seeing in bold actual subject headings. And you see some kind of what seems kind of like code underneath them. Um, <clears throat> in some of these cases, we see like in it italics BF 1729.G72 and then other numbers. These are call numbers. These are classifications that are associated with these subjects. So if you are interested in astrology and health, you could go to BF 1729.H9 and if we have books on that, that is where a book that is about that topic would be classified. You also see UF and BT and USE all in caps. So UF means used for. So astrology and health is used instead of astrology and hygiene. And we see a little note there that says this is a former heading. So this is a case where a heading was updated from astrology and hygiene to astrology and health. Uh, we also see health and astrology. So the preferred term is astrology and health. The UF is associated with health and astrology as well. And then BT is our broader term for health. Um, we also see a couple of little notes, may subbed geog. This means may subdivide geographically. So some headings can have geographical subdivisions attached to them that can provide more specificity about a location or a country that's associated with a topic. Not all subject headings can be used this way. So we, we see on the right, astrology and art, not subbed. Geog. So no geographic subdivisions attached to that one. And if we look down further on the right, we see a little note under astrometry. And we can, it actually tells us how we would use this. Here are entered works on the art of measuring the position, distance, motion, etc. of the stars. So this could tell you as a user, is this topic actually what I'm interested in, in terms of the way that Library of Congress is thinking about it? So there are many books, many of those red books that are full of these very paper thin or extremely thin pages that um, 
are covered in subject headings. So if you are interested in scary red books and browsing subject headings, uh, if we're ever allowed back in the building, they are available for you. But that's great. Uh, subject searches are not the only searches that are out there. So what else can we do? So here is an example of a known item search, a search for a book that I was interested in that I know exists. So I'm using a title search. And in this case, I'm doing a phrase because it's multiple words. So as I would have hoped, the book I'm looking for came up right at the top of this list. So I knew that the book was called Dear Committee Members. I searched for it and there it is. Thank you to the catalog for that. You can also combine index searching and Boolean. So here I'm searching TI Harry Potter. I want any of the Harry Potter books and MT and SR. So there I'm searching for a material type. Whoa there, what's MT and SR? So MT is the material type and we can do colon or uh, equal sign for word or phrase. And there's a go link there for more information about that if you are interested. Uh, there's also NSR. So this is the code for audiobook non-musical recording. These are not always, um, these codes are not always what you would guess. They are not the most user friendly. Uh, but there is a go link there as well for looking up material type codes. Um, you don't have to use the codes. You can also use the facets that are available in the catalog to do this type of search. But if you enjoy learning about search indexes and implementing those and just using um, your keyboard to search versus using facets, then this is available to you. There's also genre form searching, and this is relatively new in um, the Library of Congress world. And there are two links there that will take you to more information about finding genre form terms. And I've got a couple of these terms on this slide. So this is not what the item is about. This is what the item is. So it's a comedy film. It's a crime film. It's a haiku. So these are forms of works. And you can see different ways to search for um, different ones of these. So if it's a word, it's GE colon. If it's a phrase, GE equals. If your official term has parentheses in it, like you see with comics, graphic works, you're going to drop those out. So your search is just GE equals comics, graphic works. So here's an example. Here I'm doing GE dark comedy television programs. So that's from my genre form list. I want a dark comedy um, and I want it to be keyword about women. And I'm using that hashtag, that pound sign in there so it could be keyword woman or keyword women. And the first result that it brought me is orange is the new black. So this fits the bill there. It's a TV show, a dark comedy, and women are important to that story. So, um, there are too many codes and labels. I'm never going to remember them. Why are you telling me all of this? Well, it's okay. You don't actually have to remember the index labels. You don't have to remember the acronyms or abbreviations. You just have to know where to look to find them. And some of them, like TI as a title search, that one gets pretty easy. Um, some of these I have to look up every time I use them. But it's one of those things where the more practice you have, the easier it becomes in terms of finding and sometimes even remembering some of these codes if you are interested in them. So there definitely are cheat sheets if um, you are interested in using these. So we're gonna step back and have a quick reality check here. Why can't I find any of the things on this list? So I want a photograph of Jesus and I don't mean his face on a piece of toast. I mean, from back when he was alive. I want a photograph. I want a book about computers that was created in the 1800s. Um, I want a memoir that was written by a Neanderthal. So why can't I find these things? I am a very demanding patron and 
I demand to have access to all these things. Rachel says they don't exist. Yes, you are correct. Thank you. Um, so sometimes we can't find things because the form, photography, computers, whatever it was, sound recordings didn't exist at the time. This can be disappointing for people who don't understand about time and uh, technological innovation. Um, but there are other reasons that there might be impossible searches out there. So some searches aren't possible because the form or item the patron wants just doesn't exist. But there are also searches that don't work because the metadata doesn't exist or it isn't recorded in the catalog record. So the available metadata that's in that catalog record might not always include the information that a patron might want. And sometimes there's a good reason for that. So another question, why can't I find all of the plays written by people who have transitioned from male to female? Or I want every single symphony that was composed by a woman. Um, I want all the intro to chemistry textbooks that were written by women. Any thoughts on why I can't find these things? So we've got some thoughts on this, maybe not all cataloged yet, not an index, voices that were silenced or not given platforms, um, problems with LCSH. So where do we get information about authors? Sometimes authors or publishers choose to include biographical or personal information about the author on or within a resource therefore making it available to catalogers and researchers and making it more likely to show up in item metadata. So here I'm thinking about like a, an author biography that might be listed on the dust jacket or um, other information provided by the publisher on or with a resource. But there may be information about the author that patrons might be interested in that is not immediately shared um, by the publisher, by the author, and it's really not the job of the cataloger to search out and create metadata for all available personal information about authors and creators, even if it might be of interest to researchers. So say I know someone who wrote a book and I know that they transitioned from male to female. If that's not something that they have shared as part of like part of the text of the book, or part of their author bio associated with the book. It's not my job to go and associate that kind of information with that person in these search systems. So what we're doing is providing information about the resource. Everything that's on this list, why can't I find all of these things? People may have completely legitimate reasons to be looking for information that focuses on people, on authors and creators, but the information that's uh, contained in the catalog and in uh, MARC records may not include all of the information that people are interested in about authors. So this is not something where, um, even when we're setting up authority records as catalogers, we aren't necessarily going to go out and try to find everything personal that we can. What gender does the person identify with? Unless someone has made that very public and clear with the resources that they are creating or publishing, we don't want to be going out and like outing people. That's really bad. Um, so even if there is a legitimate research reason to be looking for sy symphonies composed by women, children's books illustrated by mixed race, mixed race individuals, that data simply may not exist. So these searches, they may be possible through keywords, but it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to find everything that a patron is looking for. So let's look at some more advanced searches. Actually, let me stop here. Any questions about all of this? 
so I think there have been some questions that have come up. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, but let me let me head back up. Um, so Terry had a question, but it looked like uh, looks like Tiffany responded to it. Um, his question was, why do we sometimes use call numbers that don't match the ones in the red books? And Tiffany responded that sometimes that's up to the catalogers judgment based on what we have in hand or on screen. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And sometimes a resource, um, there may be more than one good place for it. And sometimes it's about more than one thing. And you have to, as a cataloger, make a decision about what makes the most sense. Oh, Alyssa just mentioned we have a really great book about the ethics of authority records. I'd be interested in that. Um, something that I've thought a little bit about, probably not nearly as much as people who actually do cataloging. Um, I see uh, Paul's hey. comment. Some new fields were added that allow uh, for capturing some of this information, but they're very new. So there are authority fields related to, um, I believe, like gender. Um, but there's a lot of discussion within cataloging about the appropriateness of capturing this information, especially if it's not self-identified um, by uh, authors or creators. So there are, there's a, a lot of ethics that goes into, uh, ethical decisions that go into cataloging um, and thinking about some of these choices, thinking about the language that you're using, the subject headings that you're applying. Um, it is not a... Uh, neutral thing necessarily. Um, oh, thank you, Alyssa. Uh, ethical questions in name authority control. That sounds great. All right, back to advanced searching. So this was an actual question. A patron is looking for a UNCG master's thesis. They don't know the title, but they're pretty sure it's from the year 2004. The author has one name now, but they think uh, at the time the thesis was submitted, they probably had a different name. Any thoughts on how we would search for this? Using some of the things that we have learned so far today. Jenny says, could you use AU and OR? Yes, you could use that. That, that would be something that um, we could search for one name or the other. Very good. So here is another way that to, to come at this. So patrons looking for master's thesis probably by this person from 2004. So we can use, as Jenny pointed out, the name index labels, either AU colon or AU equals for word or phrase and the year index label year uh, YR colon. So let's look at this search. So here's what I actually did. I did not use a phrase search. I used AU colon. Um, and this actually is, I think, why I found this book or this, this thesis, because if I had used the AU phrase, um, AU equals, it would not have allowed for that middle initial which is what we see in the search results there, Michelle L. Wilkinson. So that would have potentially thrown off an AU equals search because it's not the phrase that we were searching for. Um, but the year, YR 2004, um, the rest of this is, is what we were looking for. So now we have the title of this work, Continuity and Stability of Parasympathetic Functioning Across Infancy. So this is what the patron was looking for. Um, another question. A patron is looking for movies or television shows depicting female doctors. The patron wants recent depictions only, nothing earlier than the year 2000. And we are imagining here that we can actually go into the library and check out materials. The patron wants to check them out and take them home. They don't want to stream them. How would we search for this? Any thoughts? Genre form, yes, we can use a genre form uh, search here. So we can also use, there are a couple of ways, I mean, with all of these searches, with most searches, you can do this 
many different ways. But here is one way to do this using subject and year, which can actually include wildcards, and we can search for material type. So here's the search that I did. SU, women physicians, and, and then in parentheses, MT, this is material type, and I've got my codes for DVD or Blu-ray. And then another and, and the year, two, zero, question mark, question mark. So we saw some examples earlier where it was a question mark with like four after it, I believe. There's some different ways that you can do this. And again, I'm gonna repeat myself that this is not an exact science. Um, the same search can actually be constructed more than one way in some cases. Um, so we see a couple of movies that I got here that I can check out that have a subject of women physicians and our <clears throat> DVDs or Blu-rays that are from 2000 or later. Other examples of searches that we might be able to do using some of what we've learned. Works about mythology related to North Carolina's native people. So SU mythology and keyword North Carolina and, and then we've got a long string of ors for the names of the different native people of North Carolina. We can also search books that are in the American Trade Bindings Collection for uh, books that involve cats. So B8 colon American Trade Bindings and keyword cat or keyword cats. And we could also use an asterisk or other truncation there. If I want to find works about wizards or witches for children by someone other than JK Rowling, I could do a subject search for witches juvenile fiction or wizards juvenile fiction. And this is where I can incorporate that not search, AU Rowling. I can also search for comedies about the end of the world, subject end of the world, and GE comedy um, with that asterisk for comedies or comedy. So if you want to search, this would be a great time to do some searching, choose a topic that interests you, um, do a subject search or a keyword search and incorporate a genre form or just look at the genre form list. There are some really interesting ones um, and look at the material types as well. Um, although that one I think is actually the, the least user friendly out of this list. Um, so let's look at some examples of what we might search for. So these are subjects that exist. Boy knitters, cats with disabilities, uh, family secrets in literature, social justice in art. All of these things exist because works have been created that have these topics. And then we see some examples of genres and forms. Beach party films, cool jazz, films for the hearing impaired, urban legends. And these are just a few of the very many that are out there. And then a couple of material types on the right. These are some common ones for audiobook, for book, for kit or DVD, and lots of other things. Yes, um, fake news, no jazz is cool. Exactly, I was gonna make a comment about that, but uh, you beat me to it, Jenny. Yes, sorry to jazz fans. <laughs> Um, it's not cool, uh, unless you like it, which is fine. It's great. Jazz is cool. Okay, so here's some examples. I can do a subject search for yuppies and genre comedy films. Um, does anyone know what a cootie catcher is? I encountered this when I was coming up with search examples for this. The origami thing. Yes. Yes. So. A cootie catcher is one of those origami fortune teller things. It, uh, I don't know why it's called this, but this is an actual genre that exists in the Library of Congress uh, genre form thesaurus. Um, so we can search for artist books that are also cootie catchers. We can search for cookbooks that are cowboy poetry. Um, we can search for large print works about opossums. We can search for vampire television programs that are about high school. 
So there are many, many things that we can search for using the genre form, material type subjects, and many of the other indexes that are out there. Um, so that brings me to the uh, end of this. So if you have any questions for me or Tiffany about anything that we've talked about, um, and I'm gonna see if I can scroll up to, oh, it might take a while. There are a lot of uh, things in here. Yes, there's been quite a lot of engagement. It's very exciting. Um, we did have a note that Bones maybe should have come up for your search. Uh, about That's right. physicians because obviously <laughs> there's Cam. Um, people were very interested in this cootie catcher discussion. Um, and also, uh, what would you need uh, other than Buffy for that final vampire high school search from Lois, seconded by Michelle? Great, great question. Yeah, Buffy, um, if I wanted to design a search where Buffy was the, the top result, I'm going to have to think about that. Um, interesting, interesting genre forms that we can show examples of in the catalog. Um, so I am going to try to, oops. So while, while Anna is working, if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to put those in the chat. I have learned a lot from this session. Um, I would love to take some of these slides and make them into infographics that we could use on our website and on our libguides if Anna and Tiffany are amenable to that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Anne okay. Simons mentioned that the limiter codes on the left side of the catalog are very helpful and do a lot of this um, just as another sort of way to access this if you can't remember all of the, um, like all the different terms. So library anxiety is coming up for me again. This book um, must be very applicable. So what I am doing, yes, Paul, your example. Um, the search here, SU library, library users psychology for the catalogers and non-catalogers here, this subject heading has a subfield in it. So the main heading is library users. It has a subfield, which as Paul pointed out would be an X. Users don't have to know this. Um, library users, then we would have a subfield X psychology. Can we do this search where we bring, um, where we're searching across subfields? Yes, um, it appears that we can. So we're seeing under subjects here, library users psychology. Um, we don't see the X subfield because it is not necessarily useful to users, but it is there behind the scenes. So it appears, Paul, that your, um, your search is possible. But would it work as a phrase search? Oh, good question. Okay, let's see. Oh, oh no. Um, it does not appear that that will work. So we only get one result here, soothing citation irritation. <laughs> Approaches to teaching students about bibliographies and references. Um, I would love to be able to explain how all of this works, but I can't. Um, sometimes when I'm trying to find a known item, um, uh, if you put it in quotes, library users psychology, it brings us back to, um, yeah, sometimes you just have to kind of get in there and try some stuff out and see what you get. Um, on the plus side, most folks would use a keyword. Yeah, yeah, this is not really for um, the brand new user who is new to libraries and new to using the catalog. This is for people who perhaps have a, a higher level of comfort. Um, so all of y'all who work in a library, and um, would like to be able to search from the red box or search perhaps more precisely. Um, all of this is for you. Any other thoughts or questions while we are here? 
And at this point, if people want to unmute themselves and ask their questions, um, please feel free to do so. Um, I'm going to go ahead as we are starting to get towards the end of our session and put in the uh, link to fill out our assessment form. Um, we really appreciate um, any assessment um, that, in, that you can fill out for us. It helps us think about scheduling future sessions. Um, I'm trying to make sure people have time to ask their questions. I'm actually going to go ahead and stop recording now.